Good morning. Uh, we are going to get started in this lesson, lesson 16. And uh, if you are on YouTube, follow and subscribe. And if you're on Facebook, please share. Thank you so much. Our lesson today, uh, lesson 16, I'm going to point out the takeaways from the study of the holy place. The holy place is a very, very important place in the tabernacle. And the outer court is the uh, body. This gets into the soul and this gets into the spirit. Jesus has a body, soul, spirit. We have body, soul, spirits. So when we're looking at the holy place, we're looking at uh, what feeds our soul. And of course, teaching is very, very important in this because of the shoe bread right here. With that, let's go ahead and get started in this lesson. Uh, one other thing, let me tell you this too, that uh, these lessons are in sequence, and we're going 16. We've had 15 already, one, two, three. If you follow in sequence, I keep adding things on to each lesson so that you can understand what I'm saying here. So please try to follow in sequence, or if you're just starting, it might be good to go back and follow through. But uh, again, I try to give a little bit of a big picture on the different things each time I teach. So we're looking at God's tabernacles and temples. First Corinthians 10, 1 through 7, 11 is, there's a lot of scripture here, but uh, see what it's saying. Moreover, brethren, now would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. They never made it into the promised land. Now these things were for our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. This tabernacle is for our example. It's telling us about sin, it's telling us about how God deals with sin, and it's telling us a step by step what we need to do to get saved and stay saved. Neither be idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell when one day 23,000 or three and 20,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Uh, we gotta be careful in tempting Christ. Th this is all for example, this, this is telling us how we should walk neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, all these things happened unto them for examples and they are written for our admonition, counsel, advice, caution, upon whom the ends of the world would come. So we're seeing here that God is showing us exactly what we need to do in order to get saved and stay saved. John 15, 16 says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. He says, I have chosen you, and ordained you, that you should bring forth fruit, and he's talking about winning souls, and that your fruit should remain. Very important. What is your calling? 2 Timothy 1, 9. <coughs> Who had saved us and called us, with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. We are called to God's purpose. What is God's purpose? Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Our goal is to be like Jesus Christ. And if he came to reach out for this world, it's our job now. He has made us ambassadors. He has given us his spirit to be witnesses for him. What happened once we obey the plan of salvation? We have a new identity. We enter and are a part of the church. This right here, 
Notice the outer court uh, represents 4,000 years. There's 60 uh, pillars here, a post, and uh, it represents every man from Adam until Jesus Christ in genealogy. So it's a period of 4,000 years. 10 by 10 by 20, this is a 2,000 year period. 10 by 10 by 10, a 1,000. We are in this 2,000 year period right here. When Jesus died on the cross, this line right here marks the day of Pentecost when the church started and this line will mark when Jesus returns and we begin the 1,000 year millennial period. We are part of the church. We are part of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is out here uh, in, in the tabernacle plan. And there are some scriptures that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are the same because the kingdom of God is within the kingdom of heaven. But what's important here is no one can enter into the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Uh, and God will make them a priest. Only the priest could enter here. There was all kinds of people in this outer court, but only the priest could walk through this door and enter into the holy place. We become the body of Christ, the building of Christ, this tabernacles becoming beautiful temples, and the bride of Christ. We have taken on his name, the three B's. We have taken on his name. How can we be his bride unless we've taken on his name? How can we be uh, his body? He's the head, we're the body, but if we won't even take his name on in baptism, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, how can we be a part of his body? And how can we be a part of his building? You're going to see in a minute that the, the tabernacle, which was later covered by the temple, and then Jesus became a tabernacle and temple, and then we become tabernacles and temples. The only place in the Bible where he placed his name was right there, the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat between the two cherubim. We've got to have that name. New Testament, who are the kings and priests today? I've shown you these scriptures before, but you also are a holy priesthood. You are a royal priesthood. Revelation 1.6, he had made us kings and priests. Revelation 5.10, he had made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. We're going to reign with him. That's powerful. He has made us kings and priests. A lot of times we think about ourselves as being priests, but we forget that when he died on the cross, the Levitical priesthood changed to the Melchizedek priesthood. Melchizedek was both a king and a priest. We are going to become kings, and we've got to think, well, what is this? What is a king? We've got to be conformed into his image. What do I have to do to understand that he's a king and I've got to be conformed in his image? Now, this is from a last uh, week's lesson, and it says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. This is the veil. This is the Holy of Holies. The holy place is in this area right here. And by a new and living way, which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. When Jesus died on a cross, the veil of his flesh was rent in twain, and the spirit was released. In the same way, that the veil of the temple was rent. And from that point on, the tabernacle uh, plan uh, made a tremendous change because now we have access both to the holy place and to the holy of holies. We can come into the presence of God. Only in the Old Testament, the high priest could go beyond or go around this veil right here. But today, we can go boldly into his presence. We can be in the presence of Jesus Christ. One of the greatest things about this truth is that we can have a personal relationship with the Almighty God. We can go boldly, but we cannot go disrespectfully. We better repent before we go before him. The Ark of the Covenant shows you the dimensions here. A chest, coffer, mercy seat, the two cherubim. This is where God spoke to uh, Moses. This is where he spoke to the high priest. This is where his presence was in the Holy of Holies. Outside there was the sun gave light. In the holy place the candlestick gave the light. 
But in the Holy of Holies, the presence of God there gave the light for the uh, pre high priest. <coughs> There's one crown there, meaning that he became king of kings. He is a king. Let's look at that concept. Jesus was both a king and a high priest. <coughs> we accept Jesus being a priest, but we do not see him as a king. Jesus was born a king. John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was talking about Jesus coming, setting up his kingdom, and he was telling people, repent. In the book of Matthew, which presents him as a king, he laid out his kingdom principles with the Sermon on the Mount. The crowd proclaimed Jesus a king uh, who would sit on David's throne during his triumphal entry. He told Pilate he was a king of a spiritual kingdom. He wore a crown on the cross and the sign on the cross said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. He is declared King of Kings in Timothy and Revelation. Now, let's take another look at this. Uh, a king is a ruler, judge, leader, and administrator. This is what he wants us to become if we're going to rule and reign with him. We're going to rule over people. We're going to judge people. Uh, he's going to make judges out, of, judges out of us. And there's one place that says, um, uh, let me see something about, uh, we, we will judge angels. That's strong. We're going to become leaders, and we better be a servant leader because that's the type of leader he was, and administrators. Many missed the meaning of the power of Christianity and his kingdom when they fail to submit themselves to him. He's king. We need to bow down before him. He is king. We've got to submit to Jesus Christ. They do not reference and obey him. Uh, why are so many people uh, so loose in their walk with God? Because they really haven't made them him king in their life. They do not open the whole of their inner self to him. They endeavor to serve two masters and to stand well with, with empires as different as light and darkness, heaven and hell, God and Satan. There must be a consecration uh, a giving of ourselves totally, unreservedly to him before there can be a perfect faith, coronation before deliverance, the king before the priest. The Ark of the Covenant broken down. There's a coffer, coffin, chest. There's a mercy seat. Uh, there's the tables of stone that were in it. There's a golden pot of manna. And there is Aaron's rod that budded. This should be gold. I just realized somehow I lost the gold and it went to black there, so air. <laughs> this is where the location of God's name was between the two cherubim on the mercy seat. Location of the name, Exodus 20, 24. Altar of earth, in all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee. Uh, this says it was between the cherubim. First Chronicles 13, 15. The Lord that dwelleth between the cherubim, whose name is called on it, I have hallowed this house to put my name there. The only place his name was in the Old Testament was the tabernacle right there, or temple when it was placed over it, the same pattern, on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. In the New Testament, Jesus had the name. <coughs> name. We become temples when we are filled with his spirit receive his holy, receive his, was the holy name. But think about this, I've asked people, when do you become a temple of the Holy Ghost? When you receive the Spirit of God? Mm -mm. That's only half of it. The Bible says in order to get into the kingdom of God, in order to get into the church, you've got to be born of water and spirit. You've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. The devil's going to fight you on that. There's only one scripture in the Bible that talks about baptism using titles, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Um, most <coughs> that are using that are, uh, how do I say this? They repeat the command instead of doing what it says. It's in perfect harmony with every other scripture because Matthew was there with Peter on the day of Pentecost when he says, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Matthew didn't say, wait a minute, that's wrong. He knew it was correct. 
And when you see actual baptisms in the Bible, in, in Acts 8, 10, and 19, we see that each time the name Jesus Christ is said over the ones being baptized, we have got to get the name to be a part of his church, his kingdom. One more part of the Ark of the Covenant that a lot of people do not know even exists. It's in Deuteronomy 31, 24, 26. The book of the law was placed on the side of the Ark. They don't know exactly how that was done, but it was uh, probably rolls, and maybe they were rolled around, and the, uh, the stones, the golden pot of manna, and the uh, Aaron's rod were in the middle. Uh, nobody really knows, but it says the book of the law. The Bible that they had was placed in the side of the ark. Here we have uh, Jesus is the way. He's the gate of this tabernacle. He is the truth. He's the door. Uh, this is the tabernacle plan. This is the tabernacle. He's the door, and he's the bell. He's the life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. When you're looking at the gate, the veil, and uh, first veil and the second veil, first veil, second veil, each one of them are made the same way. They're made of blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twine linen. Each one of them are made exactly the same because they represent Jesus. And uh, when you look at that, it, it's telling us something here. The high priest's clothes, again, had these blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twine linen uh, in them. Uh, he had, uh, this is one, two, three. He had four pieces of his uh, outfit that were made of blue, purple, purple, scarlet, and fine twine linen. And there was three places here, one, two, three, but there was a roof over the holy place and the holy of holies. It was a curtain that draped all the way around, and it had cherubim in it, the same as the bell. The bell had cherubim in it, and uh, it, w it was uh, four places there. So what we're saying here is that why are there four places in the tabernacle? Four on the priest. Well, we're going to become priest, and it's telling us that we're going to become tabernacles. We're going to become temples. They all had those colors. We've got to understand those colors. We've got to understand that they represent Jesus, and now we represent Jesus. This is a three duties of a priest. The, uh, uh, let me see, this is the Ark of the Covenant spirit. Uh, this is the holy place. This is the soul. The outer court is the body. And with spirit, there's three duties of a priest. One is to teach. Uh, that's the soul area. One is to offer incense. That's a praying area. And one is to offer sacrifices. That's this area right here. As priests, we are to show forth the praises of him who has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Remember this, too, that as priests, we are ministers. When we get into the holy place, only the priest could go there. The... The duty of a priest is to minister, another word for ministers, serve others, key to our walk with God. True worship, uh, he says, uh, true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. A lot of people have the spirit concept down because that's praying, worshiping, going to a church service, and, and uh, beautiful feelings we get from all that. But they're missing something very important because this door right here, this is the gate right here. Uh, that's the way. The door here is the truth. And, it, and we've got to understand the truth to ever make it through this uh, door or veil, the life. This tells us what the truth is. It's all about service to others. It's about ministering to others. And big in that thing is we have to teach others. We have to be witnesses to others. We've got to tell others about this great plan of salvation. John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Worship, to make reverence, to act, uh, act of homage, humble adoration. Highest form is 
praise. The second highest form is thanksgiving. Here is the first part, is worshiping. I love you, humbling ourselves before him. Here's the second part, to serve, do service to, obey commands, teach or preach, make disciples. That's strong. Are you worshiping in spirit and truth? If you don't have a ministry, if you're not serving in your church, if you're not getting involved in your church, chances are you're just worshiping in, uh, in spirit, but not in truth. He wants a people that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Here again is the tabernacle. Here's the holy place, the holy of holies, the outer court. Uh, there was a sacrifice was done here. There's the washing here, the anointing of the priest before he ever walked in here. He had to be born of water and the spirit to enter into the holy place. There was, uh, the, the gate was seven cubits high, uh, excuse me, five cubits high, which was seven feet. This was 10 cubits high, which is 15 feet. Uh, walls meant inclusion but also what the world doesn't like, exclusion, exclusion. It excludes some that don't go along with it. And remember, only priests could be in the holy place. A lot of people today have never been baptized in Jesus' name, never received the Spirit of God. They've been told all you gotta do is believe. You can believe all you want, but God tells us how to receive. He says, ask for the Holy Ghost. Well, we have to pursue the Holy Ghost. He tells us that uh, he told the apostles, go to Jerusalem until ye be endued with the power from on high. They went there, they were praying, they were all in one accord, and the Spirit of God came down, and they all began to speak in other tongues. Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that lead it to destruction, and many there be which be thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which lead it unto life, and few there be that find it. Here again is the tabernacle plan, uh, excuse me, including the brazen altar and labor water. Here's the holy place, the holy of holies. In here was a candlestick, the uh, altar of incense, and the table of shoe bread right there, and the Ark of the Covenant. The holy place is the kingdom of God. It's our soul, it's his soul. The enemy of the soul, the enemy of the church is the world. The world is trying to suck us into it. And God is over here trying to get us to move closer and closer to him. Who's winning the battle in your life? The holy place is the second heaven. The outer court is, is the first heaven. It's the air we breathe. The holy place is the second heaven. It's, it's basically outer space. And this, uh, Holy of Holies is the third heaven. That's where the throne of God was, and that's why that's where the throne is. Uh, in the Holy of Holies, that's where God uh, presented himself. So we're looking here, second heaven, outer space, and there's a scripture in, in Ephesians 6, um, 12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. I'm talking about some takeaways from this holy place. In the holy place, in our soul, is where the spiritual battle takes place. Uh, Daniel, he was praying. Uh, Gabriel finally came to him and says, I got stopped by the prince of Persia, a demon, a devil, who had very powerful, he was the prince of Persia. And when he left, he had, well, Michael the archangel helped. Daniel to get to, excuse me, helped Gabriel to get to Daniel. But then when he left, he had to go back and help Michael again. What I'm saying is that there's a spiritual warfare going on. And when we get into the holy place, we're going to fight this spiritual warfare. And we've got to know how to fight the battle. When a priest came into the holy place, he came in to perform the, the service. Another way of saying that is he came into the holy place to war the warfare. That's back in Numbers uh, chapter uh, 4, 24, I believe it is. Okay, so we're in the holy place, and of course, there's angels on the ceiling, there's angels on the veil ahead of them. The gold is pure gold, it's reflecting all these angels all over. 
we're in there and it's not a matter of walking lackadaisical around because if the bells start ringing, if we stop speaking in tongues, we lose the battle right there. The speaking in tongues has to exist in this 2,000 year period. And as we're in there, we're fighting the battle. We're, we're, we're seeing that God is with us and there's angels all around and he's just waiting to tell them, do this, do that. Are there really angels? Look through the Old Testament time and time again. Only the spiritual, only the true ones with faith had an understanding that there was uh, angels. In the New Testament, angels are spoken of again and again and again. There are angels. Some people have seen them. I've never had, but angels are real. The church, it's a church age. It's where continued sanctification takes place, and it's a model for discipling. Model for discipling. We see here that we have to read the Bible and obey it. The incense, we have to uh, pray and we have to offer, uh, let me see, pray and fast. Candlestick, we have to witness. Light set on, on hill cannot be hid and we have to give to people. First of all, we have to give to our family, our church, and then we have to give to those that are not in the church. Uh, it's a model for discipling. To be a, a discipler, I've got to be a disciple. I've got to get this pattern down. It's a matter of the Spirit of God will light up the, the uh, uh, shoe bread for me. It will light up the incense and tell me, mix those two together so my Spirit can help you lead people, help you in what you're saying, help you in your daily walk with God. Uh, continued sanctification. This is how we stayed, keep. God wants them. This is a holy place. There's no sin in it. If you sin, you end up back at the brazen altar. You've got to get, keep sin out of your life. And if you're praying and, and are reading and obeying the Bible, praying and fasting, giving and witnessing, you're going to stay where you need to be. We thank you, Lord, for your presence, for being with us, touching us, helping us, Lord. There's none like you, Lord. Help us to be what you want us to be. Help us to stay in the holy place. In your name, amen.